Okay, so uh, good afternoon uh, and uh, welcome to this uh, uh, ICTS Turing Lectures by Professor Mark uh, Mezard. Uh, so before uh, we start, uh, I'd like to request our uh, founder director of ICTS, uh, uh, Professor Spentawadia, to, uh, to welcome you and uh, maybe introduce uh, uh, ICTS to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, what ICTS is about. Uh, and then uh, I will request Chandan the das, Professor Chandan Dasgupta to introduce uh, Mark Method. Thank you, Abhishek, and uh, a warm welcome to all of you. Uh, <coughs> we are extremely happy that uh, Professor Mark Mezard has uh, come here, and he's going to deliver, I think, an uh, exciting set of three lectures. And this is the first one, which is of more common interest, so we thought of holding it with all of you young people here in this auditorium. But uh, before we get on there, I just wanted to, as is the tradition here, tell people about what is the ICTS, because it's a relatively younger institute, uh, which was, uh, it started functioning in 2007. So <clears throat> you have seen this uh, campus over here, and uh, so what was the idea? The idea was to bring together physicists or astronomers, cosmologists, mathematicians, biologists from all over the world under one roof. It's a, the idea of the ICTS is very idealistic, but it's very important to be very idealistic in your dreams. So then whatever happens actually is some sort of an approximation to that. To work together to solve the most challenging questions posed by nature and to provide uh, advanced uh, science education and to help create uh, scientific temper in society, how science affects lives and uphold, upholds the idea of truth. Because what is at risk in India today and perhaps elsewhere in the world is the idea of truth. What is the truth, okay? So, all right, so this vision is enabled by three interactive missions. One is uh, very strong in-house research which is the foundation of everything we do. Then there are the programs, which I will describe to you also. And using the resources of these two missions, we also are very serious about science outreach, which I will tell you about. And this particular lecture is also part of our science outreach. Okay, so <clears throat> we have been uh, a little bit over 10 years now, and uh, in the past decade, we have achieved some measure of success in all these missions, okay? So our programs have had a significant impact on Indian science. It has become an international hub of science, uh, a sort of an attractor of people from all over the world, scientists from all over the world, and mathematicians too, to come and work here and spend some time. Its faculty has made widely recognized contributions. And this is what is, we are very singularly proud that a very young institute, we were able to hire some very, they, you know, when you build a new institute, it's very difficult to attract faculty, you see, because you're not really there. So I'm very grateful to all these young people who agreed to participate in our dream and take the ICTS forward, so. And in science outreach, as uh, we are doing a lot, as I will describe to you, and that has also become a fixture for science enthusiasts in Bangalore, okay? Okay, so let me just begin by describing what our programs are to give you an idea of uh, one of our three missions. So we have uh, pedagogical schools, which are part of the education uh, mission of the ICTS, workshops and conferences and discussion meetings. And this sort of uh, natural division of uh, the uh, scientific interactions. And uh, since 2007 when we began, we actually began in Mumbai, in, that's, what, that's uh, where the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research is, and uh, then we moved to Bangalore, to the Indian Institute of Science, which hosted us for five years. 
and then we moved over here. And in this time, we have organized 159 programs and 79 discussion meetings with over 16,000 participants, and 4,000 of them were from abroad. And this, I think, has had a tangible impact on uh, Indian science. So this is a little plot of, uh, you know, you see the, once we moved into this campus in 2015, so we had our own space, and uh, it, it, is, it is very, uh, it's very, it's a good feeling that the slope of this straight line is positive, and it's a straight line, and it's going up. But at some point it has to saturate because <laughs> of the space. So we'll try to build more and welcome more and more of you. So this is a, a visual of uh, what we have done in these years. Now, what are the programs? What are our programs? So they are not just uh, standard uh, conferences. I mean, the ICTS is not a conference organizing center. It's a new model for scientific exchange and collaboration in India. Because these ideas, we have taken lots of good ideas from other institutions in the world. I mean, notably, the ICTP in Trieste, the uh, Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, the Cowley Institute for Theoretical Physics in Santa Barbara, and others. It's not a new idea, but we have integrated most of these things for our needs in India. And uh, yeah, so that's what it is. A place to gather researchers to brainstorm, to incubate new ideas, to chart out roadmaps. I think ICTS presently is the only institute in India which does this. So we have a strong pedagogical component that benefits students and postdocs and even senior researchers. I find myself attending a lot of ICTS lectures. You always feel you're a student of science because there's always more happening. So when I say students, I do include even myself and many of my colleagues will agree with that. And the important thing is that all our activity is archived, and it's on this YouTube channel, ICTS Talks, without any space in between ICTS and Talks, just one word. Okay, so these are some sample programs to show you the, the, the breadth of the uh, science that uh, sort of uh, is discussed at ICTS. So we have the scientific discovery through intensive data exploration. That's over here. Mathematical perspectives on clouds, climate, tropical meteorology, cosmology, numerical relativity, the role of theory in biology, monsoon workshop on string theory, which was one of our first programs because the, the institute was started by string theorists actually, but uh, you, you don't really feel that, do you? <laughs> I mean, so we had random matrix theory and applications, and various other areas are also all covered. And we had a very uh, interesting meeting on the ADS-CFT correspondence at 20 uh, last year. Okay, so this is a sample of our programs, and uh, paying attention to the program that is uh, going on, I'd like to mention that ICTS has been quite active in organizing programs in this very important multidisciplinary area of machine learning. So we have had the statistical physics methods in machine learning uh, in 2017. Then uh, theoretical basis of machine learning uh, was a very nice uh, uh, meeting in which uh, people like uh, Anima Anand Kumar actually gave several lectures. We had three lectures on machine learning uh, earlier last year by Sanjeev Arora, and now we have uh, uh, this week begun today, in fact, Statistical Physics for Machine Learning, this workshop. And one more is coming up, I think, in 2021. Now, I wanted to actually mention something to you because uh, a lot of these uh, meetings, uh, nobody discusses anything about biology you see, or neuroscience. And uh, so I thought I'd uh, I quote uh, Geoffrey Hinton and uh, Bengio. As you know, they won the uh, last year's uh, Turing Award. And uh, there was a very beautiful uh, uh, interview with all three of them. And so I just wanted to 
uh, read out something from here. So Hinton says, what does, somebody asks, anything is left out in all this stuff that you people are doing. So Hinton says, what does this tell us about how the brain works? People ask that, but not enough people are asking that. So Bengio says, it's true. Unfortunately, although deep learning takes inspiration from the brain and from cognition, many engineers involved with it these days don't care about these topics. It makes sense, because if you're applying things in, in industry, it doesn't matter. But in terms of research, I think it's a big loss if we don't keep the connection alive with people who are trying to understand how the brain works. And so to that, Hinton says, now neuroscientists are taking seriously the possibility that something like backpropagation is going on in the brain, and that's a very exciting area. I just wanted to, uh, this is my own uh, inner feeling that uh, uh, computer science, neuroscience, physics, all of these actually should share some platform to try to, try to understand uh, uh, how the brain works. Of course, I mentioned this to a very eminent uh, computer scientist from Berkeley recently, and uh, uh, his name is Thomas Jordan, and he said, oh, this is all a thousand years away. <laughs> but I think we should try, and I, I, I think that ICTS, we will see more of this interaction also. Okay, let me just go on. So, uh, regarding our programs, we have three sets of named lectures, okay? One is uh, after Subramaniam Chandrasekhar, the other is after Srinivasa Ramanujan for mathematical sciences, and for Alan Turing uh, for biology, computer science, engineering, and related areas. And we have had very, very, very eminent people, including today's lecturer, delivering these talks. So, today's talk, okay? <clears throat> which you will hear. And so now let me come to the next mission, research. Uh, so the ICTS research is basically divided into three parts. I mean, this is the way we sort of uh, have formulated it. Uh, one is space-time physics, that is string theory, quantum field theory, gravitational wave physics, okay? The other one is complex systems, statistical physics, turbulence, condensed matter physics, physical biology. And the third, blank over here is mathematics, that is dynamical systems, data assimilation, differential geometry, fluid dynamics, and probability theory. All this stuff is happening at the ICTS. Okay. There are researchers working on all this and collaborating, especially between these two, last two over here. Hopefully all this will... I think there are people in this area also who are very much interested in understanding non-equilibrium dynamics, so we hope that there's a lot of interaction amongst these people. Okay, so this is the faculty. So we have uh, 17 regular faculty, one junior faculty, so, so that uh, you, know, you can regularize the person later on. There's an Infosys chair, and there are three Simons visiting professors. And there's one joint faculty with our sister biology institute, the NCBS. Okay, and then we also run a very rigorous and a vigorous graduate school, actually, which is part of the graduate school of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. So we have uh, 56 graduate students, and uh, I just have, uh, instead of describing many things to you, these are the courses that are being offered this semester. See? It's fairly interdisciplinary and shows the sort of breadth of the ICTS also, okay? We have postdocs, uh, 29 in number presently, and there are visiting students. We have 17 visiting students who visit from anywhere between three months to a year. All right. Now, this is also very important that this institution actually provides a platform for new initiatives in Indian science. So I just thought I'd put in this slide. So uh, we had actually uh, done a lot of work for uh, large data high-speed networks. Uh, then uh, there's an ICTP, ICTS uh, quantitative biology program that's going on. We just got over a couple of weeks ago, and which sort of you know alternates between Trieste and uh, ICTS in Bangalore. Um, 
there are many, many initiatives. There's a monsoon initiative which I would like to mention, which talks about or works on the mathematical foundations of the Indian monsoon system. Um, I mean, I think it's a, it's an, it, it is possible to do this because there are people at ICTS who work on differential equations, who work on fluid dynamics, turbulence, and weather systems. So putting them all together, we have this initiative. And there are many other things also, okay? Okay, so now science outreach. So, I mean, it's an obvious thing to do, to simulate and uh, stimulate and harness the young minds of India, and to help create a scientific temper in society, so, and also to, uh, inform civic society about contributions from India to science, engineering, and mathematics. So this is very important. The historical role of, the historical contributions, the civilizational contributions of Indian science and mathematics are not known to most people, actually. So I think this is an important gap, and ICTS is uh, trying to bridge that also. In fact, uh, in February, we, have, we are starting a new series in honor of the great Indian mathematician Madhava. Uh, this series will uh, invite people to talk about uh, the history of science, mathematics, and technology, not only in India, but anywhere in the world. Okay, so these are a few of the snapshots of people who have come here, and you will recognize uh, many of them. We have public lectures, and uh, <coughs> They are a source of inspiration, and uh, all the people who come for our programs, many of them, we invite them to give public lectures. Okay. Now we have also a, a wonderful thing that we started in 2015. It's called Kapi with Curiosity. It means have coffee and curiosity. Kapi means coffee in, in the local language over here. This is Kannada. And um, so this is a... This has become a fixture for science enthusiasts in Bangalore. So it's held in the planetarium, it's not held here. And we have over two to 200 to 300 people coming and uh, participating in this. And uh, the last one I went to myself was by Bill Bialek. He gave a blackboard talk, actually. I think it is one of the most inspiring talks on entropy that I have heard. I mean, <laughs> from thermodynamics all the way to Shannon. <laughs> Wonderful. So it, it, is, it is on the ICTS uh, YouTube channel, so you can, you can really enjoy this now. Okay. So we also have the Abdus Salam Memorial Lectures in memory of Abdus Salam, who was certainly an inspiration to many of us uh, to do this type of an institute. And uh, we have the Einstein Lectures. We have had 33 Einstein Lectures. The idea is that uh, we will support anybody, actually, who would like to go and give a lecture to the colleges and universities of India. And up till now, we have done it for 33 such tours. And all the way from Trivandrum to Silchar in Assam, actually, people have gone giving lectures. So this is the Einstein lecture series. It doesn't have to be on relativity only, because Einstein did many other things. Then we also have the Vishweshwara lectures in honor of uh, Professor Vishweshwara, who was a pioneer in black hole physics. You know, this uh, idea of the quasi-normal modes of the black hole, the ring down that you have heard about, actually was first discovered by him. So we've had some beautiful talks, actually, one by Kip Thorne. You can see the, the, the venue of the talk is just outside over here. There were over a thousand people, so we couldn't accommodate them here, so we had it there. And this is Lyman Page uh, talking about observing the birth of the universe. What a title. And <laughs> I was most amazed. This is the second time Lyman came to ICTS, actually, to give this talk over a period of uh, seven to eight years. And this is Priyambada, who gave the last, uh, <clears throat> last Vishwishwara lecture just a couple of weeks ago. OK. so. Now, we also, now you must be wondering why we have so many of these lectures. So this, it is on each team is different. The, the Kosambi lecture has been created in honor of D.D. Kosambi, uh, a great historian of India, statistician, and a first professor of mathematics at the Tata Institute. Uh, in his honor, we have started a lecture series. 
And this is to invite people in the social sciences and humanities to come and talk to us and to the greater audience in Bangalore. So the first lecture was Pratap Bhanumeta. A little while ago, we had Tarun Khanna. And uh, on the 16th of January, we will have uh, Nayanjot Lahiri talking about Emperor Ashoka, history, memory, and uh, memorialization. This is some other interactive program which we held, including ICTS at 10. Then we also have planning, actually, the <clears throat> planning the science festival in Bangalore sometime this year. And uh, ICTS has started these mathematics circles, which are very popular in uh, many other parts of the world, including the United States. They all originally started in the Soviet Union, and then uh, there are such circles uh, in the United States, and in Bangalore we have started uh, to <coughs> have all these young kids come and uh, interact with some of our faculty and postdocs basically are running these uh, circles. Okay, so the I, like any institution, the ICTS has a uh, management board uh, whose chair is the TIFR director. It has an international advisory board. I didn't want to list all the names. And it has a program committee, which is chaired by Chandan Das Gupta. And uh, I am the founding director, but the present director is Rajesh Gopakumar. He is in the Middle East presently. He's gone to Israel for a conference. So what he would do, I have done today, is introduce the ICTS. So. And it's our resources, I mean, so the ICTS, as I said before, is a center of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, and uh, which is an autonomous institute of the Department of Atomic Energy of the Government of India. So the major source of funding for this institution is actually from the Government of India. Okay, All that you see around you was built on government money. But we also have other very important sources, which enables us to fulfill our missions and uh, this is the Airbus Corporate Foundation, which was, uh, uh, we had very good interactions with people in Paris, actually during these years. And uh, there's the SN Bhatt Memorial Grant for summer students. Then the Simons Foundation has funded us uh, for the first five years, 15 to 20, and now renewed till 23. We're very happy that this happened. And we have the Infosys Foundation of Bangalore actually, which also supports us very, very strongly, including the present series of lectures. So here are some pictures, and thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Okay, good afternoon, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce to you our speaker today, Professor Mark Mizar from ENS Paris. Uh, I'll mention a few biological, uh, Biographical, uh, not biological. <laughs> biographical <laughs> information about uh, Professor Mejar, who uh, graduated from ENS in 1980, uh, joined CNRS uh, in 1981, obtained his PhD in 1984, uh, and then he has been working uh, at uh, various uh, labs associated with CNRS and the University of Paris. Uh, <coughs> And at present, he is the director of uh, ENS Paris. Uh, he's been the director for about seven years now, from uh, 2013 or 12. Uh, <clears throat> he's a very highly distinguished uh, physicist, uh, theoretical physicist, who has uh, worked on you know, many different problems and made very important contributions in all of them. Um, I should mention uh, some of these highlights. Uh, he was uh, involved in the development of a, a theory, uh, theoretical description of um, uh, disordered systems like spin glasses, uh, the low temperature disordered fa or, uh, phase that you have in spin glasses. Uh, uh, he, along with Professor Parisi and others, actually developed a uh, theory of that, uh, which provided some understanding of what is going on. Uh, in particular, uh, <clears throat> his work led to uh, the so-called cavity method, which has been used uh, quite extensively in uh, many uh, <coughs> problems uh, since then. Uh, he also worked uh, on uh, a variety of other uh, disordered systems, just structural glasses and disordered uh, uh, superconductors and things like that. And uh, I must say that, you know, in the... Uh, 
uh, 80s and 90s when uh, I was working on some of the similar problems, I actually learned a great deal from his papers and also from uh, the interactions that I had uh, with, with Mark in various conferences and so on. Uh, <coughs> his uh, work, uh, which is sort of more relevant to the uh, series of lectures that he's going to give uh, um, today, involves basically the interface between statistical physics and uh, problems in computer science. Uh, he was uh, among the pioneers who showed that uh, various concepts and techniques of uh, statistical physics can be used uh, quite profitably in understanding various problems in uh, computer science, such as uh, satisfiability problems, uh, learning algorithms, uh, then um, statistical inference and things like that. Uh, his work has led to uh, development of a deeper understanding of many of these problems and also has some practical applications in the development of uh, algorithms which work uh, very well. Uh, he has uh, received uh, many uh, awards and honors. So I'll just mention a few of them. Uh, this is the uh, silver medal of uh, CNRS, then Ampere Prize, Humboldt Prize, uh, Onsagar Prize of the American Physical Society, and many others. Uh, he's the uh, author of two very well-known books, which uh, uh, students and researchers in this field uh, find very useful. Uh, so, I mean, uh, we are very happy that uh, he uh, has uh, uh, taken the time to come to uh, Bangalore and give uh, three lectures as part of the Turing Lectures. One is, of course, the public lecture today, and then he will give two more lectures uh, tomorrow and uh, the day after. Uh, so it is my pleasure to invite Professor Meza to give the lectures, but just before that, I would invite uh, Spenta to give a memento to uh, Mark. Thanks a lot for coming. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here today to, to talk to you about artificial intelligence. It is a topic that has attracted uh, so much attention. And um, I will start with the first chapter, which are the myth and the reality of, uh, of the recent progress in artificial intelligence. And I will start with the myth and with the, with the strong statements. There is no lack of very strong statements about artificial intelligence. Actually, my wife was reading yesterday the Hindu Times, and she told me there was a paper saying artificial intelligence will make one eternal. So that's a strong statement. And there are many other ones. Here is uh, some of the statements by Ray Kurzweil, who got the Lemelson Prize, National Medal of Technology, by President Clinton. And... Um, What's actually happening is machines are powering all of us. They may not yet be inside our bodies, but by the 2030s, we will connect our neocortex, the part of our brain where we do our thinking, to the cloud. We are going to get more neocortex. We are going to be funnier. We are going to be better at music. We are going to be sexier. So I leave it to, to, to all of you to see if this happens in the next uh, 10 years. Um, and uh, our colleague, uh, Terry Sejnowski, uh, at UCSD, says artificial intelligence will make you smarter, a kind of short summary of this big statement. There is the other side of the coin, and the other side of the coin are people who are worried, and, and deeply worried. Uh, Elon Musk is well known for his statement about uh, the fact that AI is a fundamental existential risk for human civilization in a way that car accidents, airplane crashes, faulty drugs, or bad food were not. They were harmful to a set of individuals in society, but they were not harmful to society as a whole. And Stephen Hawking um, stated, I fear that AI may replace humans altogether. If people design computer viruses, someone will design AI that improves and replicates itself. This will be a new form of life that outperforms humans. And one should say that certainly uh, Hawking had a, had a kind of um, personal interaction with artificial intelligence because he, as you know, he was interacting mostly through machines and he could see himself the progress of the machine and how the, the, inter the interaction uh, could, uh, could make progress. So these are statements, and, and the thing that I want to do today in this talk is to try to introduce you to what is the reality, what is taking place. 
And it is true that we have entered a kind of new era of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, the world has been around for 60 years or so, a bit more than that. And, uh, and there have been uh, e enormous uh, hopes about artificial intelligence changing the society already 50 years ago. And nothing has happened, or very little has happened. But now, in the recent, uh, in the recent time, in the last 7, 8, 10 years, there was a, a new development, uh, and the new development uh, took place, which is called machine learning with deep neural networks. And I will explain to you all of these terms so that you get an idea of what is taking place. And it turns out that these new developments, they have made very substantial progress for the first time in some uh, important problems which had been around for many decades and which we didn't know how to really uh, handle. One is the understanding of images uh, in the sense of being able to detect, segment, recognize objects and regions in natural images. And I will give you some, uh, some examples of that. One challenge which has been quite influential is in the field was this uh, challenge around the ImageNet uh, database. Uh, the ImageNet database is a large visual database of, uh, of pictures and uh, it contains um, one million Im basically one million images and they are classified in uh, typically 1,000 categories. It means that there are around 1,000 images of each category. And in some sense, the challenge which came with the database was to be able to classify these images and to say, this is a dog, this is, I don't know what, a pizza probably, and so on and so forth. And so uh, there was this competition, and this is the result uh, that, uh, uh, that was obtained by various competitors uh, in, in, in over the years. This starts in 2010, and we go here up to 2017. And this is typically the percentage of e errors. It means uh, how, what is the fraction of time that uh, the algorithm that has been proposed makes mistake in, identi in classifying the image. And you see, in 2010, there were quite a lot of the, of the teams which, uh, which were around uh, more than 50% errors. And uh, the best one was uh, around 25% errors. And it gradually improves. And then in 2012, there is a breakthrough. And the breakthrough is with one team, which is the first team you see here. I don't know if you can see it in the back, but there is one team which succeeds in, in going somewhere around 13%, and all the other ones, they are still above the 20%, and they are there. This one is the first one that started to use deep learning. The next year, all the teams had catched up, and they are all more or less, the, the, the best one is going down, and, and it all moved, and we, we now have, are very close to perfect recognition. Uh, most of the team are less than 5% wrong. So it's an in incredible improvement in a few years. And this improvement is due to the introduction of these, of these deep learning methods. So this is classification. Then there is another aspect of it, uh, of image analysis, which is also extremely important, which is segmentation. Image segmentation is to take an image like that and to be able to say, well, in this image, there are cars, there is a street, there are houses, there are people, and so on and so forth. Give a description. I take a picture of that, and the computer will tell me it is a conference hall. People are bored, they are sleepy, half of them are sleeping, the other half is trying to wake up, and there are 150 persons, half women, half men, and so on and so forth. That is, it, it looks simple, but it is something that we were totally unable to do 10 years ago. And so there is, there is a revolution taking place in image analysis. And of course, if you have image analysis, you can analyze the scene around you, and you can, you can understand what is, understand quotation mark, I will come back to it, and, have, and this opens the way to the self-driving car. At the same time, if you have self-driving cars or self-driving trucks, you have uh, the possibility of, for instance, uh, having convoy of self-driving trucks, and um, this is something which is, of course, quite interesting, and it's at the same time, um, it poses some, some question for the society. Uh, in Europe, uh, there are 13, 13 million of heavy trucks on the roads of Europe. 
and probably larger numbers than that in US, I don't know in India, but there are enormous, will be an enormous change of society if these truck drivers go to do something else and you have the truck which are automatized. So this will also create some challenges to the society. So we will have all these aspects, the, the scientific innovation, the technological innovation, and the impact on the society. Some other progress, some other examples of progress are several of them. I will give two or three examples in medical, in medicine. Um, this is a, a result of a, a study that was made uh, two years ago in Nature. People, colleagues using deep neural networks in order to analyze these uh, skin lesions to try to see if, this, if the skin lesions that are pictured here, they are in the first, in the, in the first row, they are benign, the other one are malignant, and you have to identify which one is which. And it is uh, not at all trivial. They used uh, uh, machine learning, and um, the result is quite spectacular. The artificial neural network achieves performance on par with all tested experts, demonstrating an artificial intelligence capable of classifying skin cancer with a level of competence comparable to dermatologists. This is quite, uh, quite interesting. It's also in terms of public health is something that is quite useful. And you should say that it can be done by, with a picture that you take with a smartphone. So you have a, something that you find a bit suspicious. You can take the, the image, send it on the web, and get the result saying you'd better go to the, to the dermatologist pretty soon or can take your time, let's say. Um, another one that, uh, that appeared uh, quite recently, there were several papers in the last six months about breast, breast, breast cancer screening, which means analyzing the mammographic uh, images. Uh, one of them, uh, probably the first one, was in uh, April 2019 by a, a group uh, in NYU. They created an absolutely giant, gigantic database of one million images of mammography and trained it. And in the end, uh, they are able to ach achieve uh, um, a prediction of what is the probability that there is breast cancer, which is uh, measured by this number. I will not explain exactly how you measure the performance, but basically the larger the number, the better the performance. And you find that the individual radiologist gets a performance of 0.778. The artificial neural networks gets a performance of 0.876, so much better than the individual radiologist. And you need a panel of 14 radiologists and to have them uh, discuss and average their prediction in order to beat the, the prediction of the, of the neural network. Um, the last one, just to, uh, about uh, predicting uh, uh, non-small cell lung cancer prognosis, again by fully automatized uh, image analysis. Um, again, uh, the results suggest that uh, they can predict the prognosis of lung cancer patients and thereby contribute to precision oncology. So this is to give an example of the applications, the applications that are coming. Uh, pretty soon. This is everything that I stated so far was in this subfield, which is a very important subfield, which is image analysis. It is probably the one on which the progress has been most spectacular. But there is more than that. Language analysis, language understanding, translation is another field, lip reading, predicting the activity of potential drug molecules. When you invent new molecules, can you predict what their, their, what, what their, their activity will be? analyzing particle accelerator data, doing quantum chemistry, uh, designing new molecules, playing games, many, many new applications. I will just mention a few of them. Language understanding, translation. Translation has, has made quite some progress. Uh, I, I was searching for an automatic translation from Canada to, to English. I could not find one, so I will not, utter, but you have to develop it. It will be a, a challenge for the for the next uh, year. Uh, uh, then there is, of course, uh, the thing that, uh, that is quite spectacular, if you use a bit of automatic translation, you will see the progress that has been made in everyday's language. That is very clear. If you have simple sentences, something basically on which you have a lot of data. Let me just open a small parenthesis. Um, for those of you, uh, of you who know French, this is the, 
the beginning sentence of a, of a book by, by Proust. And uh, uh, this sentence, if I put it in one of the main uh, translators using deep neural network, it does a translation which is a, a reasonable translation. Uh, the machine is, is pretty good. It, it gives, a, it gives a, the meaning, let's say. But uh, uh, the, the Proust masterpiece called A la recherche du temps perdu in French, no machine can decide whether the title should be translated as In Search of Lost Time or as Remembrance of Things Past. These two titles have been proposed to, to translate Proust's uh, piece. Both of them are valid, and it, it's a problem of, of, uh, of uh, really creativity. I mean, uh, literary translation is something that is, that is a creative activity. And for this, uh, the machine is very far from being able, of course, to, to help. The games, AlphaGo, uh, in, in 2016, AlphaGo wins against uh, Lee Sedol, the Korean who was uh, the, the big champion. At that time, uh, well, of course, it started, uh, it started in the 90s. Uh, at the end of the, of the 19, uh, around 1997, there was Deep Blue who was winning at chess. But Deep Blue was using a kind of, of hard power of the computer. And everybody knew that Go could not go this way. It had to be because there are many more moves which are possible at each time in Go. So you cannot just explore everything. You, knew you needed a new strategy. And the new strategy used, uh, used the deep networks and, uh, and it made it. Uh, the first AlphaGo uh, was using, uh, uh, analyzing 160,000 human Go games before reaching this performance. But a couple of years later, they came with a new program that trained not from human-based uh, uh, games, and so it did not extract the human knowledge in some sense, but it trained against itself. It generated games against itself and was just finding what was the best strategy by uh, iteration. It's called reinforcement. Recently, in the last year, we have the first uh, programs which are able at uh, beating human players at poker, six player, no limit hold them. I'm not a, a poker player, so it doesn't mean much to me, but it is something that is a, a big challenge. It is something in which you have to, to be able to bluff and so on. It's, uh, and this is the one that excites most my son, which is the fact that uh, in October 2019, the program becomes a grandmaster at StarCraft II. And um, again, in all this, you, you start to drift from something which is extremely precise, well-defined, to something in which you will have interactions. We'll have interactions, much more interactions, not just one-to-one -one in, a, in a winning game, one-to-one, -one, but you need cooperation and you need interaction. So this is some of the ideas of, of what is taking place in just six, seven, seven years. It's quite spectacular. And so I would like to take a, a, a few minutes to describe you qualitatively. I will not enter into the math, but give you an idea of how this took place. And uh, uh, there is a big concept in here, which is called machine learning. Machine learning is the idea that we will be using machines. Machines are computer algorithms. And these machines, they learn by themselves. You teach them how to learn, but you don't give them, you don't program them explicitly. And um, so basically, a, a machine is, is, a, is a computer program. You give it an input. It has a lot of knobs inside, and uh, it will adapt all the knobs so that when you give it an input, it produces the right output. So. A lot of activity has been dedicated to identifying cats and dogs. It's a stupid activity, you will tell me, but it turned out that it is one case in which we have an enormous amount of images available because people like to post uh, their cats' pictures on the web. So uh, you can, you can take, take this challenge. You, I give you a, a picture and you tell me if it is a cat or if it is a dog. And so the idea is to take a machine which has a lot of these possible knobs and, and you will present it with cats and dogs and, and train it uh, until it, it has all the, uh, all the answers which are right. So basically, you, you have a lot of images of cats and you tell it each time, you say, I present this image and I say this, you should answer that it is a cat. 
present this image, this should answer that it is a dog. And so initially you, you take a random machine, completely crazy positions of the knobs. It answers nothing. But gradually the machine will turn the knob and say, well, if I perform better, if I get a better number of results, of positive results for cats and a better number of positive results for dogs, I adopt this new position of the knob. And I do it again and again and again. Until I satisfy, until I am able to really give the correct output for all the images. Now, if you have succeeded in doing that, that is, that is called the training. The machine will be trained. It will be trained on an enormous database with many, many images. And then, of course, the big challenge will be to present a new image and to see if it is able to perform well on an image that it has never seen. So then it means that it has, the machine, in some sense, has understood something of what is a cat or what is a, or what is a dog. This was a mistake, yes. What are the machines that have been used in the recent time? They are called uh, basically artificial neural networks. Uh, the idea of artificial neural networks goes back to, to several decades, actually. Um, in, in the present context, uh, you could say that everyone would recognize this as handwritten digits, let's say, and one recognizes the digits, even a few years old child knows that and can read this. He can read that using the brain and in particular, these uh, visual areas of the brain, and inside the brain, the basic elements, the basic constituents are the, neuro, are the neurons, which are the cells of the brain, and the neuron is, is built from uh, uh, the body of the neuron. It receives some uh, information from these pieces, which are called the, the dendrites. It processes the information, sends it along this axon, and then sends it to the other neuron. So there is an idea that in the brain, the information goes from one neuron to the next. It is processed, it is sent to another one, it is sent to another one, it is sent to another one. And that is the idea of artificial neural network. In artificial neural network, these are computer systems in which you have elementary, elementary, uh, very small processor which do basically very little things. They will take the information from incoming neurons and this information they will more or less sum the information from all the incoming neurons, but they adapt it with some weight. So for instance, this one will have a very strong influence. It is signaled by this, by this big arrow. This one also. This one, it has a dashed arrow, it will have a negative influence. If it is active, this, this neuron is active, it will inhibit the activity of this other neuron, and so on. So you have, so, and the knobs, the knobs that I was talking about, are exactly the values of this transmitted, how, how you weight the signal that is here, how it is weighted before being transmitted. This one has a strong weight, this one has a negative weight. So the output of the yellow neuron here is the sum of the inputs modulated by these buttons that are here and with a kind of thresholding function. So the knobs, which I call the parameters, are these weights, the weights for each input. How much, when, you, when this one is active, how much does it influence the other one? So the idea is, is relatively simple. You could say directly, okay, I have an image, I, have, I put a neuron associated with its pixel in this image, and I do the weighted sum of all the, of all the action, and I see what is the signal that I received on the neuron which is there, the one, 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 and I would like this to be the digit number five. So I would like that the signal be very strong on this one and weak on all these, the other ones. Can I do that? This actually is a very old idea. This idea was uh, invented by uh, Rosenblatt in the 50s, and uh, it was the idea of a direct connection between an input image and the output space. And then you have to learn the, the weights, the value of these buttons between each of these squares and each of these output uh, neurons and try to see if you, if you make it. This was quite exciting at that time because it was a new way of computing, nothing to do with the, with the standard, uh, uh, the standard uh, computing machine that we, that we have used and that we use uh, every day. It was so exciting that uh, uh, it went, it made all its way to the to the New York Times, actually, and that's that's a statement, of course. 
uh, it was uh, uh, Rosenblatt was working for the Navy, and so the New York, New York Times paper in July 8, 1958, you see it's not yesterday, says the Navy revealed the embryo of an electronic computer today that it expects will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence. They forgot to say it would be funnier and sexier than us, but uh, they, that, that was the next paper. Um, unfortunately, this perception, it turned out that the mathematicians, uh, colleagues, soon understood that there were many things that it would never be able to do. It was just too simple as a machine. And so, what is new since then is that we have developed what is called multi-layer perceptrons. We have had large database, we have much more computing power, and we have some uh, uh, in interesting uh, improvements in the machines that has turned this idea, this original idea of, of the perceptron into something that is full-fledged and that is really working. So, one of the big ingredients is the availability of large database. This has been a major breakthrough. For instance, the, the this is a very small sample of the MNIST database. This is a database of hundred and handwritten digits, 70,000 images. They are classified when knows that the output of this should be a zero, the output of anything in the second line should be a one, etc., etc. And now you can you can you can go a bit beyond what uh, what uh, Rosenblatt was doing by taking a three-layer. Uh, neural network. This is the input. The input will be the image, the, uh, one of these images. It is an image which has 28 square pixels, it means 70, 784 neurons. Each of these neurons it can be active or inactive, it's black or white. And then from this input here, from these 70, 784 neurons, you project onto a hidden layer of 50 neurons and then to the output which has 10, which has 10 possible outputs. This is in itself a relatively uh, big machine. It does not have the limitation of the perceptron. Actually, one can prove that this can be turned into a universal computer. It has 12,000 parameters. All the lines going from one neuron to another, it is, it is one of the knobs that I can turn. It has a certain value. And, uh, and the idea is that one has to find the 12,000 parameters such that all the digits in the database are well identified. And how do, do one do that? Well, basically, roughly speaking, one does it one by one. That is, uh, one, one looks at this, at this parameter here. So maybe this one was a strong activation. If this is active, it strongly activates that one. And one, for instance, one will try to diminish a little bit this activation. Does it improve the performance? Does the, does, the, does the computer that one obtains this way, does it behave better on all the 60,000 digits than, than the previous one? If it does, one accepts this change. And one iterates that many, many times. So it takes computer time, but we have plenty of computer time available. And so when you do that, when you do that, you, after some time of training, after a long training phase, uh, you test on some uh, new examples, and you see what is, what is the performance. In a simple realization, like the one that I have described to you here, see, it's all extremely simple. It's just, you have, the, you have the parameter, you turn it a little bit, a bit more, a bit less, you see which one is more favorable, you accept, you refuse. You do that many, many times. You do it with this architecture here, you will find that you have a machine which correctly predicts 96% of the new images that you present already a good performance, only 4% errors. If you go to a better neural network, it will mean a deeper architecture. A deeper architecture means that instead of having input, one layer, output, you will have more layers like that. Of course, it will be more parameters, it will take more time, and so on. But with a deeper architecture, you will be correct at 99.8%. It means that you will find, in the end, only 21 errors uh, in, in the database of 10,000 examples. And these are the errors. These are the digits that are not well identified as numbers. Most of them I would not know. I don't know what the guy wanted to write when he wrote that. I don't know what, uh, what it should be. And this, I, maybe this is a nine, but I'm not sure. So this is, uh, this is, uh, this is a successful 
machine. This is a deep neural network. It has an input layer, a first hidden layer, second hidden layer, etc., etc. You have to imagine that on a much bigger scale. Here I present it with, you know, 10 neurons in each layer. You have to understand that it can be 100,000 lay 100, neurons and hundreds of layers. So it can be very, very large. But in the end, uh, it is a relatively simple machine. All the rules are very well known. And, uh, and, the, and the learning is, is as simple as the one that I was trying to explain you. You train it on a very large database, our famous favorite cats and dogs, for instance. And then with that, you succeed in classifying. You succeed in segmenting. You succeed in doing the medical predictions. And um, basically, one thing that is interesting, if you look at the analysis of faces, facial recognition is one of the big successes of, of these uh, feed-forward neural networks. Basically, you present an image in the first layer, and you can try to understand what the system is doing by looking at what the neurons are, are sensitive to. You will find that one of these neurons here, it will be, for instance, this one, it will be most sensitive to an image like that. So it will be a kind of edge detector. It will see here there is an edge. And then you will see that maybe this neuron here, it is sensitive to that. Ah, that is a combination of edges detected here. But this combination of edges, it starts to, to, to resemble an eye. And then, et cetera, et cetera. And you go deeper and deeper. And in the end, you start to have neurons which are sensitive to faces. And you will one have neurons which will flash and say, this is an image of your grandmother. So that is, that is how it works. It is elaborating the, it elaborating the information gradually from very local information and putting it more global until it extracts it uh, completely. All this is very nice, big success, an incredible technological breakthrough that took place uh, uh, under our eyes in the last uh, seven years. Everything is perfect. The machines are smart. Uh, are they solving all problems? Uh, I think that there are a few clouds in the landscape, and I want to mention to you uh, some of them. And I will focus on three main problems that I will address uh, sequentially. Uh, the first problem is, uh, is the need for very large amount of data, pre-processed and labeled. Uh, there is no understanding and no guarantee of results. And there is no general intelligence, no reasoning, etc. Let me first start with the data. I told you about a database of millions of images, um, and they have to be labeled. So this is highly impractical. Uh, because, because you need to generate this database and you need to have people who label them by hand in order to, say, uh, to, in order to train the computer. So this is a, a practical limitation. It also gives, in some sense, a proof that deep networks are very, very far from uh, uh, mimicking uh, the brain. There was this, uh, this discussion between uh, Hinton and Benjo that, that you mentioned at the beginning. And I want to, to hit a little bit on, on this issue because I think it is a very important one. Um, the, the, the very process by which a, a deep neural network is learning seems to be fundamentally different from what is taking place in the brain. And um, I, I, I will give you some examples. You can ask well, how many examples of a cat does a baby see before he builds a mental representation of the concept cat. Certainly not. 100,000 cats, certainly not. And uh, actually, this has been documented in some sense. Here is uh, an experiment that is, um, that is done at, uh, in my home institution at Ecole Normale Supérieure by in the group of Anne Christophe. It is about the language acquisition by, by babies which are 20 months old. And uh, uh, she was running ex uh, uh, experiments. They are around playing with the, with the kids. Uh, and they were playing uh, for some time with four objects. There is an object which was called a co-rabbit. There is an object which is called a K-tractor. There is an object that is called a K-book. And an object which is called a co-ham. So they have these four toys. They are used to play with them. And, oh, give me the co -hen. And, yes, uh, oh, have you seen the K-tractor? How it is nice? And so on. Play like that for some time. And then... At some point, they project 
two images on the screen and, uh, and they ask the child, oh, look at Ko Bamul. Bamul, I hope it does not mean anything in Canada, but uh, for us it means nothing. It's a completely created word. It does not exist. And the two objects that are here are also invented objects. And so you ask the child to look at the Ko Bamul. Do you see the Ko Bamul? Look at the Ko Bamul. And so I will ask you, now that you have been playing yourself here in this room, you have been playing for at least one minute with a co rabbit, a K tractor, a K book, and a co hen. Who among you, when I say look at a co bamul, who looks at this object? Nobody. Who looks at this object? Quite a few people, and then the other people are not decided or don't dare to present there. You do exactly as the kids do. That is, what you do is that you generalize in some sense. This does not exist, but if it existed, it looks more like an animal. And in some sense, the prefix co has been associated with animals. And so you have generalized the concept of animal and associated it with co from two examples, not 100,000. So this is something that is, that is certainly a main difference. And so uh, the, we have come up uh, uh, discussing with all that, come up with, a, with a, a challenge. And the challenge would be to build a machine, maybe a deep neural network of a new kind or a new kind of computer program, new kind of artificial intelligence that learns a language on the basis of what has been heard by a baby in his first year of life. There are some people who have started uh, registering what a child hears in his first year of life. It turns out that uh, uh, the understanding, I mean, speaking, it takes uh, a time, an amount of time which varies a lot between children. We all know that, know that actually. That's experimental. Uh, but it is because uh, speaking needs a kind of uh, motor control. While understanding is more stable, it's around one year that people, that the children understand the language. And so, and, and it's always one year. It does not depend on whether they grow up in a, in an environment in which they will hear a lot of words or an environment which is more silent and so on, it's always one year. This does not at all fit with all the, the models that we have so far. So it's a new challenge. And um, I think that I hope that some of you in the, in the audience in the next few years will pick up some of this challenge because it is this type of interaction and of challenge that, that will create the right interaction between the new developments in AI and the development in trying to understand uh, language and intelligence. Here is my second, uh, my second, um, uh, the second problem that I have with the present development of uh, of, uh, uh, of neural networks, of artificial neural networks. What do we know about the deep networks, and what do we understand? Well, imagine that you have a network and you have trained it very well, and so. Basically, you have turned all the values of all these parameters, all these knobs are turned to the optimal way. It performs perfectly on the training database. And if you present a new example, it generalizes finely. You have the machine, it works. And you know the machine, you know all the neurons, you know what each of them does, you know what is the parameters with that come in. This is what I call the neuroscientist dream. You know the activity of every single neuron. It's like a neuroscientist who would know in a task, the activity of every single neuron in the brain, and know the efficacy of the synapse, the synapse going from one neuron to the other one. Well, you would say, now, if I have done that, that's perfect. I know everything. You know everything, but you understand nothing. There was a, an amusing paper two years ago by these two colleagues uh, entitled, Could a Neuroscientist Understand a Microprocessor? They took an old microprocessor, actually something of the 15 years ago, and they decided to try to understand how it works uh, without, I mean, taking the, the tools from the neuroscience. So in neuroscience, you will say, okay, let me see if I put this input, what, the, what, is, what is the output, and so on. Maybe if I, if I knock down this thing, what happens? I knock down another thing, and so on and so forth. They were never able to understand what was happening. They had perfect measurements. They never understood how it worked. And this is a situation that we have. We understand actually very little of what is taking place. We have the learning mechanism itself, even if it is the simplest phase, 
of the process is poorly understood. We are making progress. A workshop like the one this week at ICTS is largely aimed at that. We have a lot of people working on understanding why the learning can work, why such a simple idea of turning the knobs one by one and so on is, is, is working. Um, but basically what is, what is missing yet, uh, even if again there are some, some, some actions in that direction, but it is still very far from being done, is the understanding of the collective processing of information. Because basically the information, we are in a, in a kind of a situation which we call emergence. Emergence is a concept that we use a lot in statistical physics. It is the idea that basically the information for us from a single neuron is, is something that is not so uh, interesting, but it is always a collective information that will be important. And the collective information contains more information than the sum of each constituent because of the, of the interaction between the constituents. And, uh, and we know, for instance, we have that, we have learned that uh, a lot in, uh, in physics. We know that if we have simple atoms, I mean the atoms are molecules, molecules of water, they are all the same, but they int and they interact with some laws that we know very well from the basic physics uh, course, you have learned that. But nevertheless, even the, if they are the same molecules with the same interaction, depending on the condition, depending on the pressure, for instance, the water can be a liquid, or it can be a solid, like a, 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 an ice cube, or it can be a gas. And this is typical of an, an interacting system. It's what is called an emerging system. It does not exist at the level of one, two, or ten molecules. It needs to have millions of molecules in order to, to see that, and it's a collective effect. And that's, ma that's what makes the understanding of what is taking place in the neural network very complicated. The fact that we understand very little has, 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 uh, has some deep consequences. Uh, in particular, um, the fact that we have no way to explain the decisions that can be made by a machine. And this is extremely important even for social acceptance of the results of neural networks. Uh, this is one of the main challenges. And we have no guarantee that it works in all circumstances. And let me give you some idea of, of, of the challenge that, that it poses, even technically. I mean, you could say, well, this is an idea of the scientist. Uh, the, the, he wants to understand everything. But if it works, who cares? Well, it works, but I, it, it is very important to understand and to be able to guarantee. If you are not able to guarantee, here is what can happen. Among the various games that, uh, that, uh, that uh, colleagues have been playing with, there was one that distinguishes Panda from Gibbon. And so you take, a, you take a neural network, large, you train it from a large database, many images of pandas, many images of Gibbon. You present that picture at the generalization phase and you see what, how do you say? And the, the, the network answers, this is a panda. It's not very sure, but around 60% confidence. It's clearly a panda. You present this one, and this one he says, this is a gibbon with 99% confidence. What happens between the two? What happens is that I have added to this image a very tiny image like that. It is a, a, a kind of noisy image with a coefficient which is extremely small. So you don't see it by eye. You cannot see that I have added seven per less than 1% of green on this pixel here. You know, it, to me, it's, it still looks completely black. But this small perturbation, it has completely fooled the neural network. How comes? Well, this is perverse. This is uh, another team. So there was a first team of scientists who had built the computer, and another team of, com of, of scientists had said, OK, I will generate an image that will fool your computer. And how did they do that? Well, they trained an adversary neural network, another one, in order to generate the best image that added to the panda will fool the computer. And they came up with this. So this is bad. This is bad because it means that we have no control. Another example is, uh, is this image here. It is classified as a banana with a lot of confidence by the initial machine. Perfect. I have my big network, well-trained. It sees that, it says it is a banana. Well done. And then someone comes up and puts a sticker on the table here. And you present this new image to the machine, and the machine says, oh, this is a toaster. 
Again, the sticker has been generated by a perverse colleague who has trained some adversary network in order to find the best shape of the, trick of the, of the sticker that will, the best shape and colors of the sticker that will fool the original machine. So this is serious. This is a serious problem because if you have, uh, if you have a, detection of, a detector of images that you use to drive a car and it is very good at recognizing the stop, stop sign, but if there exists a patch that if you put it on the stop sign, it is, it is seen as a green light, that is a serious issue. And, uh, and, and we know that there will be, if the patch exists, there will be crazy people sticking the patch on the, on the, on the stop sign. So, okay, so I think understanding is, is important and, and guaranteeing some performance in the worst case is also very important. Third problem we have with, uh, with the present situation in, in uh, neural networks is that there is no general intelligence, no reasoning, no representation of the world, no consciousness, no attention. Deep networks are machines that solve very specific problems, very well-posed problems, a chess game, a go game, you know exactly the rules of the game and you know where you want to go. They are well-posed. The target is well-defined with a, simple, uh, a very simple measure of performance. And uh, uh, in, uh, with this, I want to make a small parenthesis about uh, the link to intelligence. It's a, it's a very complicated topic, and I will address it by a small corner of, of intelligence, which is scientific intelligence. Not that I say that scientific intelligence is the most important one, but it is the one that, uh, I don't know, I am most acquainted with in some sense, so I, I choose this one. Um, that was a statement by Chris Anderson, chief editor of Wired in 2008. And he said, look, now it is the end of theory. The data deluge makes the scientific method obsolete. Faced with massive data, the traditional approach to science, hypothesize, model, test, is becoming obsolete. The new availability of huge amounts of data, along with the statistical tools to crunch these numbers, offers a whole new way of understanding the world. Correlation supersedes causation, and science can advance even without coherent models, unified theories, or really any mechanistic explanation at all. So this is bad, and I am sorry to present these sentences in front of college students. Don't believe it. I will tell you uh, now my refutor of, this, of these statements. Uh, it, is, it is bad, and it is serious. I mean, it's no longer... Um, misidentifying a panda and a gibbon or a banana and a toaster, who cares in the end? It's about the scientific method. So, I mean, it's about uh, uh, going back to Galileo in some sense. Uh, the guy, Anderson, tells us no, no need to build a model of how the behavior of the of a heavy bodies, the fall of heavy bodies is, is doing and, and to do an experiment to test it. No way. Just take many images. So let me do a, f a thought experiment on that. Let me imagine that uh, the, 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 the goal is to understand when you throw an object in the air, where it falls. Okay? And I follow Anderson, and I don't try to analyze it by my physicist tools, but uh, I take a camera, and I take uh, 10,000 of throwing, uh, 10, times throwing the object, looking at where it falls, I look at all these movies, and I feed the neural networks with tens of thousands of experimental trajectory. Probably, a well-trained deep network will give good predictions based on the object mass, initial velocity, initial rotation, shape. Probably. Probably, if you have been careful enough to, among the parameters that you measure and that you feed each time, you should have, for instance, uh, uh, the speed of the wind. It's an important thing. If you have not measured it, no way the neural network, even with many images, will be able to, to guess it. Speed of the wind, maybe the humidity, because it will impact the friction coefficient and things like that. So maybe, imagine that we have done that all very correctly. It is as good as solving Newton equation. The Newton equation, Newton equation would summarize basically the problem in, uh, in, some, in a couple of equations which are extremely, extremely simple. There is Newton's law and the law of friction. And you look at uh, uh, 
uh, the velocity, the acceleration, and you, and you integrate this uh, with stuff. Scientific model here has a compact representation. It has a compact representation of what is taking place. It decomposes the problem. It will tell you, you have to look at the, at the velocity, at the angular momentum, at the gravity, at the effect of friction. Then, and then you can combine the various ingredients. You start with just pure Newton's law. Then you add the, uh, the friction. Then you add the Magnus force, and so on and so forth. Scientific intelligence is expressed in terms of models and equations. It's based on composition of elementary laws. And because of that, it can be applied to very different contexts. If you have decomposed it this way, then you can, at some point, you will understand that, well, you have to be clever, but there has been at least one person who understood that, that the same gravity law applies to the movement of planets. This, you will never see it by analyzing a movies of throwing a, a a stone uh, many times, and even if it is an apple, it will not work either. So it is infinitely richer than simply predicting a trajectory. And this is the heart of why the scientific method is much more, it can be, it, the fact that it is decomposed on, on relatively simple moduli, simple laws that you combine, and then you can apply these laws in various different contexts, it's something which is extremely important. Deep networks in constructs, they have no reasoning, no representation of the world, no notion of causality, no consciousness, no attention, no possibility to apply knowledge in different contexts or to combine it with other information. This means that really, even if we have, and I have told you a lot about the success in the first part of the talk, even if we have seen an incredible technological success, we are still extremely far from general artificial intelligence. So uh, it's time for me to kind of come to, the, to some kind of conclusion. And uh, I anticipate a question that always comes when, when one talks about artificial intelligence. Uh, people say, well, what is going to happen? And uh, so I will try to tell you something. But first of all, I want to emphasize that predicting the future is always very complicated. I mean, it's better to say uh, that people have not been able to predict the future before. That is easy. And these are a few sentences of, uh, of um, people uh, looking at uh, uh, technological breakthroughs and predicting what will be their impact and seeing uh, 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 the value of this prediction. 1977, there is no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. I remember that I, at that time, I was completely sharing this opinion. I thought that this was just dedicated to scientists like me but I would not see a, any reason why anyone would like a computer. So, AI, as I said, is, is extremely smart and the new development of machine learnings and deep networks are very smart at uh, uh, solving very specific problems well posed with a simple measure of performance. Uh, so, when we'll see and it has started, and when we see the impressive progress of AI and uh, ability to detect subtle patterns in massive amounts of data, major technological breakthroughs, and it is extre evolving extremely fast. The number of people working in it is increasing fast also, and uh, it will have a significant impact on a large number of human activities, and it will transform many jobs. For the first time, probably, it is also a transformation that goes beyond physical labor. It's a transformation that touches intellectual labor. Like, uh, you know, um, doing the analysis of mammographies that I was showing at the beginning, it is a, a very tiring uh, job for, for the trained uh, medical doctors who do it. And some of them will do it several hours a day. And uh, it is something in which, and it is repetitive. It is very important, of course, because it is the first screening about uh, what one should do if there is a, a risk of breast cancer or not. And so if, if the computer, if one can have a system which is computer assisted that helps the medical doctor to do that, that is very good. At the same time, it can also kill many jobs. So there is a positive view. It can help to achieve better diagnosis, case law search, displacement of people and goods along railways, freeways, etc devices that help people to have fast access to relevant information, customer support, robots that can help, 
elderly people, identification of pathogens, development of new drugs, smart language assistance, and so on and so forth. One can, uh, th there is a big question, and I have talked uh, to several economists about, the, about this issue, whether this whole transformation of the society will, will create more jobs than are destroyed. The ex past experience says that a big technological innovation goes in that direction. It's always difficult to say. So that is, that is something that is not really under control at the moment. Now you can also have a, a more concerned point of view, saying that there might be large destruction of jobs and also that the change is taking place at such a high, uh, a high rate. I mean, it is changing so fast that the society the societies will have a hard time to adapt. I mean, you cannot transform from one day to the next a truck driver into someone who will uh, uh, use, uh, I don't know, computer-assisted uh, facilities in order pro to program the, the, the movements of all tracks of the company. Um, you, and another, another important aspect of it, which I find uh, also uh, interesting and maybe in some sense worrisome is that it is very strongly monopolistic. Well, we see it with the big companies of, of, uh, of high tech and their access to the data. I mean, the fact that it relies so much on a very large amount of data, it makes a strong bias towards big companies which have these, these data. And to all of us who are providing freely our data to these big companies. So this is also in the structure of the society, this is something that one should concern. Um, there is a major concern for the present, and I'm not talking about the future. You have understood that I have already eliminated the fact that we are going towards global artificial intelligence, I mean, the robot that is more intelligent than us and so on, not at all. We are very far from that. But still, we have to be concerned. We have to be concerned about uh, the use of AI in the political world for control of populations and manipulation of information. Uh, this is a statement by George Soros. I want to call attention to the mortal danger facing open societies from the instruments of control that machine learning and artificial intelligence can put in the hands of repressive regimes. Uh, in some uh, regimes, uh, the, you, you know that you have a, a, a concatenation of information from various databases into a centralized database that creates a social credit system. The uh, Chinese have started experimenting that. Based on that data, people are ranked, they are evaluated by algorithm, and that will determine whether yeah, they pose a threat to the, to the state or not, or they will just also determine whether the person has the right to put uh, the child in the best school or not in the best school, or to have a privileged access to the, to the airplane. This is not something of science fiction. I mean, this is taking place now. In 2008, Malaysia equipped the police forces with face recognition devices. Singapore's experimental program to equip every lamppost with a camera connected to a facial recognition facility and a crowd analytics software. Zimbabwe signed a deal with a Chinese company to build a national image data ware. This, this is all contained in this paper uh, on the Journal of Democracy, which I found quite interesting about the present threats of uh, artificial uh, intelligence. Uh, in particularly, facial recognition and so on is something that, is, that can be put in the hands of a, of, a, of, a, of a totalitarian regime, for instance, and that can uh, make it uh, quite uh, efficient. On top of that, there are also many examples of political manipulation of information uh, using deep networks. And so this, we have seen examples, plenty of examples of that. There have been some on the Brexit, there have been that on the, on the American elections, and so on and so forth. So there is an urgent need for control mechanisms, for the elaboration of ethical rules, for the development of a global vision on the possible impacts on our societies. Um, Henry Kissinger, in, in this article uh, last year, says, Philosophically, intellectually, in every way, human society is unprepared for the rise of artificial intelligence. 
And so, in some sense, my talk was to try to prepare the new generation for that and then re raise your awareness, also tell you about uh, what it is. I mean, there is nothing, you know, it's not big math, it's not so complicated. Well, of course, when you go to technical conference of that, it becomes quite complicated. But still, the basic principles, they are easy to, easy to understand and also the limitations. So, just a few take-home messages. Um, the fact that we, have seen, we are seeing an absolutely spectacular progress technologically. It can help humans in sophisticated repetitive tasks. It can also be misused. One has to be aware of the dangers. And uh, we are, of course, extremely far from general artificial intelligence. Probably we have not made any progress in that direction. The latest development of the last seven years, they are nice technological development, but not a step towards real artificial intelligence. And finally, it's a case, an amusing case, in which we know everything of what these machines do, but we understand very little. We understand very little of why these machines, when you add the small sticker, changes its mind and says that the thing that was a banana becomes a toaster. And um, that's it. Thanks a lot. So maybe we'll take some questions. Yes, I will be happy uh, to take questions. Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, so uh, we can take some questions, and uh, so uh, please raise your hands, and then uh, uh, the microphone will go to you, and you can ask the question. Okay, so maybe for the first question, uh, I think you had a question. Yeah. So, so has there been any progress in training uh, training a neural network to decide whether an abstract art is good or bad, or a, a painting or an artwork, can it? Can um, I don't know of anything about abstract art being good or bad, because I think that in this case, we don't have even the, uh, you know, all, all what I, was, I have presented here is called supervised learning. Supervised learning means that there is a supervisor. There is someone who says you, in the training phase, there is someone who, who shows you a picture and says, this is a cat. And so you would need, for what you say, you would need a supervisor that says, this is good abstract art, this is bad abstract art. And this, I'm not sure that, I, I'm sure that it does not exist, such, that, uh, such a concept. On the other hand, if I, if I generalize a little bit, there has been, uh, there has been some interesting developments about, uh, about art. For instance, you can train a, a network to, uh, you train it on a database of all the pictures of Van Gogh, and um, and you and so it is way, very well adapted to to seeing the the picture of Van Gogh, and then you present to it, I don't know, a picture of yourself, and you ask it to basically taking the codes in the later, in the in the nearly last layer, the codes are codes for Van Gogh. You know when you have, sorry, I've not been clear. Let me let me sum, let me say it again. You take a neural network and you, and you train it to recognize many different painters, the works of many different painters. So there will be Van Gogh, Picasso, and so on. And it does well. And so you, for instance, in some internal representation, deep in the network, there will be a code saying, this is a Van Gogh. And so then you mix that and you activate this code, but you put in the first layer, you put a picture of yourself. And it will produce as an output, it will produce a picture of yourself designed by Van Gogh. And it is not creative, but anyone who sees this, I don't have the example with me now, anyone who sees this says, oh, this looks like a Van Gogh. So it, it captures something. But it is not creative um, uh, otherwise. It's copying in some sense. Hello, sir. Uh, this lecture was very intriguing, actually, so thank you for that. I just wanted to ask this, how is quantum computing helping the advancement of artificial intelligence? Uh, quantum computing is a quantum computing is a different field, uh, uh, at least at the moment. Uh, the, the way in which it might help one day is, is if really we can come up with quantum computers that are much faster and much more efficient than traditional computers for doing these tasks. We are still extremely remote from that. I mean, the recent progress on quantum computing, which has been quite uh, advertised and so on, 
is extremely specific, it's extremely far from uh, any kind of general computer. And so um, I think that it will take many, many decades before this. Uh, I'm not sure that, uh, that the artificial intelligence with the deep networks will, I don't know exactly where it will go. I am not sure that the quantum computing will succeed in building a kind of general purpose computer that is much faster than the traditional ones. And so the merging of the two, it will take many decades. I will not see the result. Maybe you will not see it either. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. So I wanted to ask, what are the mathematical tools uh, which are used to study these AIs, AI ne and neural networks? Oh, this is broad. This is this is uh, very interesting questions. Um, first of all, I should say that the way that work, they work. They are defined by very elementary operations. If you if you um, remember how it was done. Let me show you back this image, how they are built. Um, basically, ah, sorry. Basically, it is a very simple operation that is each each neuron here is doing a weighted sum, so it's just very simple linear algebra. You have the sum of these of the activity of each of these input neurons with some weights. And then and then you apply a nonlinear function to that. For instance, you say that if it is below a certain threshold, it is the output is equal to zero. So all the basic rules, they are just uh, elementary elementary linear algebra. With some, uh, with some very simple nonlinearities. So the definition of what one is doing is very simple. Now, the complications of, uh, of the study of that is that if you, if you think, for instance, about, uh, about learning, let me, you think about learning, you are learning, this one was a, a, a relatively small network, it had only 12,000 parameters, but you, you work with networks which are one million parameters. So one million parameters is one million real numbers. So it's a, it's a space of one million dimension. And, uh, and you have to search in this space of one million dimension, you have to search for the point, or maybe the set of points, in which the, uh, in which the network is performing well, in which it is identifying correctly all the cats and all the dogs. This is very complicated because of the large dimensionality of the space. And this is where much more sophisticated uh, math or theoretical physics tools uh, become, uh, become useful and, and, have to be, uh, and have to be used. But there is a strong contrast between the elementary description of what the system does, which can be done by really, you know, uh, very simple tools that are accessible as soon as you know a bit of linear algebra, and the sophistication of the analysis and trying to understand, which has to do with understanding what happens in this very large dimensional space. As, as a whole, it is nonlinear because at each, I mean, here there is there is a linear sum of the of the inputs, but then this guy applies a nonlinear function. So the whole system is nonlinear in the end. So it is not trivial. Uh, good evening, sir. Here, first row. Yeah. Oh. Ah, sorry. Uh, uh, could you talk about some applications of AI in fundamental physics, and uh, if any of these applications have reached that level of maturity as any of the um, mainstream applications like cat dog identification has any application in fundamental physics reached that level of maturity? Yeah, I think um, I am not uh, an expert of this, but I know that it has been it is being used in some cases in um, experimental particle physics for particle detection. 
I mean, trying to do, you know, it's, it's a major problem when you have accelerator data and you have an enormous amount of information coming out from any shocks between two particles at very high energy because you have many particles coming out and so on. So most of the time, actually, most of the events you just throw away because you don't have enough disk space. So you will typically what was done is to use some triggers, which is to take, uh, you take only, you, you keep only memory the events in which you have uh, two particles coming per particular at that kind of speed, for instance. That was very elementary. But you have much more sophisticated one that you can get by, by training a network on previous images or on artificial events. So this is one field. The other field in which it is also very much used is in uh, experiments in astrophysics and trying to also detect uh, uh, subtle uh, patterns uh, in the sky. And that is at least, there are at least these two, but some, certainly many more than that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So you give the example of uh, the baby uh, who needs to look at only a few images of a cat to recognize a cat, but the neural network needs to look at uh, thousands of images to do the same. Uh, but then the the baby has some innate capabilities which uh, which are uh, in its genome in its uh, dna which took hundreds of millions of years to uh, develop whereas the ai is uh, starting from a blank slate uh, slow to so to speak so how do we uh, you know uh, is it fair to compare uh, the two in this case <laughs> Uh, no, it is not fair. It, it is just uh, it was just a simple statement to to prove that they are functioning on very different bases. Uh, the thing in language analysis has been quite spectacular for many decades. Uh, some colleagues working in uh, uh, in language art, uh, in language analysis, they have they have been developing a lot of. Uh, of programs of software based on rule analysis. I mean, they know all the syntax, all the, all the rules that tell you if there is this word, there must be a complement, if there is a complement, there must be, etc., etc., in order to, to understand the language. This has had some success, but in the last five years, uh, in uh, automatic language analysis, the, the, th the, the new programs that have come up using uh, Mr. Anderson's strategy, which is get rid of all these rules and just take a lot of database and use it, this is the strategy that has been successful. Clearly, if one wants to go beyond, at some point one will have to mix the two approaches. That is, one will have to understand how to mix the approach which is rule-based, understanding, I mean, putting in the, in the system the grammar, the structure, the, the rule, the basic rule that the child uses, which is a kind of simplicity rule, that is, uh, you have two categories, there is a new one, you put it in this category or that. If it doesn't work, you make an exception. That is how we learn as a child, we learn language. Get, get all these to interact with the, with the deep networks that have been developed recently. I think this is a, a very important challenge for the next uh, several decades, probably, which will be to mix the approaches. Nice talk. Um, thanks for it. Um, so my question was, you, you showed a picture where you showed developments in the last few years um, by teams which always improved um, in detection of um, these images from um, the database. So I was wondering what, if you could summarize what uh, changes have occurred in these years which make these networks better. So what, what exactly has, has been tweaked? Oh, it has been, I mean, uh, the, the big success is due, to, is due to, first of all, computer power, the fact that we have been able to use the, uh, networks with very many layers and very big ones, so with millions of neurons, being able to find in these several million dimensional space finding the optimal set of all the, of all the weights, of all the parameters, has been, uh, if you would have asked me 10 years ago if it, was, if it would be possible, I would have told you, no, certainly not. It turned out that people tried and it worked. This is one of the challenges, which is why does it work? Why is it simpler than what 
it, it should be much harder. Finding a point in a one million dimensional space is something crazy. So uh, the, the big success is due to the computing power, uh, allowing to have large systems and to the database. This is really the, the big things. And then there are a lot of technical developments that have been put on top of that, which have uh, many names and the whole zoology, because there are many people working on all that. Each of these technical details is also uh, important in the practical implementation. But um, uh, I think in, in some sense, um, I was discussing this with uh, Yann Lequin, uh, uh, and, and I, I remember Yann saying once, uh, we are at a stage in which, uh, uh, you know, when there was uh, the discovery of heat engines, Heat engines, they were successful and they, they were the start of the industrial revolution in some sense. But for more than a century, you could not understand what was happening with heat engines. They were just working. And, uh, and then it took uh, more than 100 years to develop thermodynamics to understand what is the entropy and all these kind of strange things. Um, so maybe we will face the same kind of problem here with the drawbacks that I think that we are also touching subjects in which it will be complicated, even from the pure technological point of view, if we are not able to control, in some sense, the worst case. In some sense, we need to be able to say, uh, the machine will never do this or that, let's say. And, and so we, have, we, we need to have, a, to have a control of the worst case. And I go back to the, the sticker and the banana. Okay, okay maybe we we'll take this question and then... Yeah, we can... Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Yeah, here. Yeah. So you uh, talked about uh, scientific intelligence. You talked about general intelligence. So my question is, uh, we know that Alan Turing has uh, to, um, wrote a paper about that machines can think. We, we know about that. He alluded, uh, Alan Turing alluded that machines can think. And we also know about that problem of other mind. We can't know that what the other mind is thinking. So in regard of that, um, how do you differentiate uh, uh, a, a machine which, is, which has general intelligence and a machine which has artificial intelligence? So what is the basic difference between man and machine? Have we uh, improved from wh where we were in times of Alan Turing? Yeah, um, again, I, I will say, uh, I think there, is, there are some limitations which are clear at the moment, the fact that these machines that we have, they have no representation of the world. They cannot use what they have learned in a different context. And no, not, no transposition. They are dedicated to a, a simple, well-defined task. So uh, they have no notion of causality. This is very important. That's probably the first notion. So there are several big things that, uh, that, are, that are there. Then, on the other hand, and, and to be a really... Uh, complete about it, I think that uh, one also has to keep in mind that uh, the way we define intelligence is probably drifting a little bit. That is probably, if I would have asked, um, if, or if you would have asked me 30 years ago, you were not born, but uh, uh, someone has, has asked me, uh, is playing chess an intelligence behavior? I would say probably yes. Yes, this is, uh, I mean, it requires to to have a strategy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A good chess player is an intelligent person, and so on. And probably now, uh, I would say, or other people would say, yes, in some sense. But you know, machines can do it. So, in some sense, our definition of what is intelligence is shifting, and it is shifting towards more creative tasks. And that may be that may be, if I want to end with a very positive note, I mean, uh, one could hope. But in some sense, using AI, one can, the simple AI that we have now, uh, one could uh, help people get rid of the most repetitive part of intellectual task and focus on most creative ones. This is a hope. But as I said, there can be also bad direction that can be taken. So, Mark, so uh, the, the bad examples that you gave towards the end of, of when small perturbations lead to bad recognition of the banana and so on. Uh, I, I guess these have something to do with the robustness of the solutions that you've found, right? Uh, yes. The, the robustness of the coefficients that, 
that have been identified for the given task. And, but because you, you are in a high dimensional space, uh, you presumably also have multiple solutions. And there must be ones which are more robust in distinguishing Probably yes. Others, but so is there, there is a whole activity. Yeah. Yes, there is. A, I should have said that there is a whole activity. I mean, there is a there is a people who 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 programs the machine and make it learn how to recognize a banana. Then there is a perverse guy who programs another machine to to generate a sticker that will fool the first machine. And then there is a third guy who say, now I want to find the machine that is most robust against all the stickers that can be put. And this is another, this is an activity that is existing. It is very complicated because in some sense you have to control all the directions in this very large dimensional right. space. So does it have something to do with sort of an understanding of the basin sizes or does it have to do with uh, memory capacity? Or I think what's, it's what's more, com more complicated than that, I think. So I fear, yes. Hello, sir. Uh, so it's claimed that the brain, uh, brain usually uh, learns in the presence of noise. For example, if there are two sounds coming, we can actually focus on one particular sound if there are two kinds of music playing. But uh, this doesn't seem to happen in these neural networks which are like susceptible to even single pixel attacks. So like, what's really happening? What's, th what's missing? At the moment, I, w I was saying there is no notion of causality, uh, consciousness, and so on. Uh, consciousness, I would maybe the premise of consciousness would be attention. At the, at the moment, it is not included in all these machines. That's another ingredient that, that should be done. And again, it's part of this very vast program of trying to add to all these, which are very interesting and spectacular um, progress and very dedicated tasks, add something that will be able to, to, to use some of the things that have been learned in a certain context, to use it in another one, and focus and I think paying attention to something is part of it. Okay, so I think uh, um, um, so there are several questions from people who are watching this on YouTube, but maybe we'll just take uh, we'll just take one question uh, since uh, getting going to food. So uh, this is a question from Sangram Deshpande, and uh, okay, so it says, uh, would machines be more powerful or intelligent than humans? Uh, what do you think about consciousness as an algorithm? And maybe you have already... The question about con consciousness? Uh, yeah. What do you think about a consciousness as an algorithm? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think much. I, the only... I, the, the, the I, I, I have been working on neural networks. And my friend David, who is here, was also in, the, in this group of, uh, of scientists working on neural networks in the 80s and in the 90s. And already there, at that time, it was... It was recognized that if you want to understand, to, to make the bridge between artificial neural network and what happens in the brain, there was this notion of consciousness. That was one, uh, one of the major challenges that had to be met. And I think that all what we have seen recently, which is this renewal of the activity of artificial neural networks, is very nice from the technical, technological point of view but it has not made any move of even an inch in the direction of going, of understanding what is consciousness, for instance. So I have not much else to say than what I was saying in the 90s, which is I don't know. Okay, so I'm sure there are many other questions, uh, but uh, let's thank uh, Professor Mezar for really fantastic. Uh, Thank you. And